Hello, my friend. Welcome to the study. some background of the story of Roland. We'll read a section of the English text to send you off to a relaxed state. And then we'll have a look. some of the peculiarities of the language. So there will be some paging through books, some whispered reading, a few little figures. With some plastic sounds and some paper and pen noises and writing. Song of Roland is about the Frankish King Charlemagne, who has been contending with the Saracen incursion into Spain and fighting against the King Marsile, who holds out in Saragossa. 
rossa Marcel has begged for peace and Charlemagne in answer to this peace offer sent his two cousins Bassin and Basile to negotiate with Marcel however Marcel had their heads chopped off and the fighting continued Saracen King Marcel had an advisor and while deciding what to do about the Franks his advisor Blancandrin who was very shrewd and calculating advised Marcel to make a deceitful promise to Charles, suing for peace, promising that Marcel would give Charlemagne treasure, and that Marcel would come to Ace. When Charles hears this message, he agrees to send a messenger. His nephew, Roland, or Roland, is there and reminds him what happened to the previous messengers. And tells him should send Roland's stepfather Ganelon, which Charlemagne does, remembering what happened to Bassin and Basile. Ganelon is none too happy that Roland has volunteered him for this mission. When he arrives in Saragossa, angry with Roland. He conspires with Blancandrin to kill Roland. So when Charlemagne's army procession goes through the mountain pass at Roncesvalles, Roland will be guarding the van at the back and that is when the Saracens will make their attack and ambush this last section killing Roland Roland proved himself very 
skillful and sometimes overly bold and was very popular among the peers and the Franks very successful on the battlefield his best friend Olivier a most courageous warrior also one of the twelve peers of Charlemagne so Charlemagne's army passed through the Roncesvalles Pass and at the rear was the guard with Roland and Olivier and some more of the Frankish barons as they came into the narrow pass the Saracens sprang their trap and attacked Olivier and Roland argue repeatedly about whether Roland should sound his horn, Olifant, and summon Charles back from the front of the line. Olivier thinks it prudent to do so, as they're being attacked. But Roland refuses to sound Olifant, saying that he will not drag Charles into this pass to be killed. Also at the pass, guarding the back, is the bishop. says to him at the first Saracen attack, Companion Roland, blow your horn. Charles will hear it as he rides through the pass. I swear to you, the Franks will soon return. God forbid, replies Roland to him, that any man alive should say that pagans made me blow the horn. My kinsmen will never have to bear that reproach. When I enter into the thick of the battle, I shall strike one thousand and seven hundred blows. You will see the steel blade of Durendal covered in blood. The Franks are brave men, and they will strike courageously. For those from Spain, there will be no escape from death. Olivier said, I see no blame in this. I have seen the Saracens from Spain. The valleys and the mountains are covered with them, the hillsides and all the plains. Vast is the army of this foreign race, but we have a tiny company of men. Roland replies, My desire becomes all the greater. May it never please the Lord God and his angels that France should ever lose its fame because of me. I prefer to die than to suffer such shame. For the fine blows we strike, the Emperor loves us all the more. Roland is brave and Olivier is wise. Both are marvelous vassals. Now that they are armed and mounted on their horses, 
neither will avoid the prey for fear of death. The counts are brave, and their words lofty. The treacherous pagans ride on in great fury. Olivier said, Roland, just see all this. The enemy is near us. Charles is so far away. You did not deign to blow your horn. If the king were here, we should suffer no harm. Look up towards the Spanish pass. The rear guard, as you see, is in a sorry plight. Those who are part of this one will never form another. Roland replies, Do not speak of such outrage, a curse on the heart which cowers in the breast. We shall stand firm and hold our ground. It is we who shall deal the blows and hack men down. When Roland sees that the battle will begin, he becomes fiercer than a lion or a leopard. He hails the Franks and calls to Olivier, Lord, companion, friend, such words should not be spoken. The emperor who left the Franks with us allotted us twenty thousand men, and to his knowledge there was not a coward amongst them. For his lord a vassal must suffer great hardship, and endure both great heat and great cold. He must also part with flesh and blood. Strike with your lance, and I with Gerendel, my good sword, which was a gift from the king. If I die here, the man who owns it next can say that it belonged to a noble vassal. Archbishop Turpin, some way across the field, spurs on his horse and gallops up a hill. With these solemn words he calls upon the Franks. Lord Barons, Charles has left us here. For our king we must be prepared to die. Roland has made his way to the Spanish pass, riding Veanti, his good swift horse. The arms he bears become him well but he brandishes his spear and turns its point towards the sky, a pure white pennon fixed upon its tip, and its golden streamers fluttering down upon his hands. His body is noble, his face fair and smiling. His companion follows close behind, and the Franks hail him as their protector. Towards the Saracens he looks fiercely and humbly and tenderly towards the Franks, and he addressed them in courtly fashion. My lord barons, gently not too fast, these pagans are heading for great slaughter. Today our spoils will be fine and noble. No king of France has ever had such wealth as at these words, the armies come together. Olivier said, I have no desire to speak. You did not deign to sound your olifant, so you receive no help at all from Charles. He knows nothing of this and shares no guilt. Those who remain with him are not to blame. Now ride for all you are worth, my lord barons, Hold your ground in the field. In God's name, I beg you, let it be your resolve to strike blows, to give and to receive. We must not forget Charles's battle cry. At these words, the Franks cried out. Anyone who heard the call of Montjoie would have been reminded of true courage. Then they ride. O oh God, with such great zest, they spur on their horses with vigor to speed upon their way, and they go to strike. What else were they to do? But the Saracens had no dread of them. See now, Franks and pagans joined in battle. Marcille's nephew, 
whose name is Eorroth, is first to ride out before the host. He hurls insulting words at our Franks. Treacherous Franks, you will join battle with us today. He who should have protected you has betrayed you. The king is a fool to have left you in the pass. Today the fair land of France will lose its fame and Charlemagne the right hand from his body. When Roland hears these words, O oh God, what anger! He spurs on his horse, lets it race ahead. The Count rides on to strike him with all his might. He breaks his shield and tears his hauberk open. He splits his breast and shatters all his bones, severing from his back his entire spine. With his spear he casts forth his soul, and giving him a firm push, makes his body topple. With a free blow of his lance he flings him dead from his horse. He has broken his neck in two. He will not forego, he says, the chance to rail at him. You utter wretch, Charles is no fool, and never a man to care for treachery. He acted properly in leaving us in the pass. Today, the fair land of France will not lose its fame. Strike, Franks, the first blow is ours. We are right, but these wretches are wrong. A duke is there. His name is Falsaron. He was brother to King Marsile. He held the land of Dathan and Abiram. No more foul traitor exists upon this earth. Between his eyes, his brow was spread so broad, its measure was a good half foot. His grief is great to see his nephew slain. He breaks out from the throng, intent upon a fight, and shouts the pagan battle cry. Towards the Franks he hurls these mocking words. This day the fair land of France will lose its honour. Olivier hears him and is greatly enraged. He urges on his horse with golden spurs and goes to strike him in courageous fashion. He breaks his shield and rends his hauberk, ramming the tails of his pennon right into his body. With a free blow of his lance, he flings him dead from his saddle. Looking down, he sees the wretch lying there, and addressed him in ferocious terms. I am not hindered, villain, by your threats. Strike, Franks, for we shall vanquish them with ease. He shouts, Mon joie, the battle cry of Charles. And the battle rages on. And each verse tells of a single combat between Saracen and Frank. And we have Marguerite Auton, Anglais de Bordeaux, Beranger Astremaris, Curé Guérin, and many Saracens. The battle is terrible, and now joined by all. Count Roland is no laggard. He strikes with his spear while the shaft still lasts. With fifteen blows he has broken and destroyed it. He draws forth Durendal, his fine naked sword, and spurs on his horse to strike at Chernoub, the Saracen opponent. He breaks his helmet with its gleaming carbuncles, slices off his coif and his scalp, as well as slicing through his eyes and his face, his shining hauberk with its close meshed mail, his whole body right down to his crotch, and right into his saddle, which is of beaten gold. His sword came to rest in the horse itself, he slices through its spine, seeking no joint, and flinging them both dead in the meadow on the lush grass.
Then he said to him, Villain, you set out to meet your doom. A wretch like you will not win today's battle. Count Roland rides through the battlefield. He holds Durendal, which cuts and cleaves so well, and wreaks great havoc amongst the Saracens. What a sight to see body piled upon body, and all the clear blood spilled all around. His hauberk and his arms are red with blood, and so are the neck and shoulders of his fine horse. Olivier is not sparing with his blows. Twelve peers deserve no blame, and the Franks hack and hew. Some pagans die, some are made to faint. The archbishop said, May our barons win, he shouts Montjoie, the battle cry of Charles. Olivier rides through the thick of the prey, his lance shaft is broken, only a stump remains. He goes to strike a pagan Malin. He breaks his shield, wrought with gold and flowers, and smites both his eyes out of his head. His brains come spilling out over his feet. He sends him toppling to his death with seven hundred of their men. Then he slew Turki and Esturcu. The shaft breaks and shatters right down to his hands. Roland said to him, Companion, what are you doing? I do not care for a stick in a battle such as this. Iron and steel should be put to use. Where is your sword named Alteclair? Its hilt is of gold and the pommel of crystal. I could not draw it out, replies Olivier, for my need to keep striking was so great. Lord Olivier has drawn forth his fine sword, just as his companion Roland insisted, and he brandished it in knightly fashion. He strikes a pagan, Justin of Valferre, severing his head right down the middle. He slices through his body and his saffron birni, his fine saddle ornamented with gold and gems, and sliced through his horse's spine. He flings him dead before him in the meadow. Roland said, I recognize you, brother, for such blows the emperor loves us. On all sides there is the cry of Montjoie. And the battle rages on. How many lances were broken and turned red with blood? How many pennons, how many ensigns torn? How many lives of fine young Franks are lost? Never again will they see their mothers or their wives, or the Franks who await them in the pass. The battle is awesome and intense. Olivier and Roland strike many blows. The archbishop deals more than a thousand. The twelve peers do not hold back, and the Franks strike in unison. The pagans die in their hundreds and thousands. Those who do not flee have no escape from death. Whether they like it or not, they meet their end. The Franks lose their best defenders. They will not see their fathers and kinsmen again, nor Charlemagne, who awaits them in the pass. In France, there is a most terrible storm, a tempest with thunder and strong winds, rain and hail in great quantity, lightning strikes again and again, and the whole earth, in truth, begins to quake. From Saint-Michel de Paris to Saint, from Besançon to the port of Isson, there is no house whose walls do not collapse. At high noon, a great darkness gathers. There is light only when the sky is rent. No one could see it without a feeling of dread. Many say, it is all over with us. The end of the world is upon us. They do not know it, but their words are wrong. It is the great sorrow for the death of Roland. 
rocks have struck with courage and vigor. The pagans have died in swarms by the thousand. They cannot save two from a hundred thousand. The archbishop said, Our men are very brave. No one on earth could have better men. It is written in the Frankish annals that our emperor has real vassals. Throughout the field they go in search of comrades, weeping with grief and pity for their kinsmen, to whom their heart goes out. King Marsile rises up against them with his army. Marsile rides through a valley with his great host, which he has assembled. The king has mustered twenty divisions. Their helmets, studded with gold and gems, shine bright, and so do their shields and their saffron bionni. Seven thousand bugles sound the charge. Great is the noise for miles around. Roland said, Olivier, companion, brother, Ganelon the traitor has sworn our death. The treason can no longer be concealed. The Emperor will exact great revenge. We shall have a tough and violent battle. No one has ever seen such an engagement. I shall strike with my sword, Durendal. And you, companion, will strike with Alteclair. We have wielded them in so many places. We have put an end to so many battles. No shameful song must be sung about them. Marsile sees the slaughter of his men, and as his horns and trumpets sounded, then he rides with his great assembled host. Out in front rides a Saracen abysme. He had no greater villain in his company, a man of evil traits and mighty treachery. He loves treachery and murder more than he would love all the gold in Galicia. No one has ever seen him play or laugh. He is a man of courage and great zeal, and thereby a friend to Marsile, the treacherous king. He carries his dragon ensign, to which all his men rally. The archbishop will never care for him. On seeing him, he wishes to strike him. The Franks see that there are so many pagans on all sides. The fields are covered with them. Time and again they call upon Olivier and Roland, and the twelve peers to act as their protectors, and the archbishop told them what was on his mind. Lord Barons, do not indulge in base thoughts. In God's name I beg you not to flee, so that no man of worth can sing a shameful song. It is far better for us to die fighting. And no one fails to call out, Mon joueur. And the battle rages on. The Franks beginning to lose more numbers as Roland and his twelve peers cannot stand against the number of Saracens. The battle is awesome and frenzied. The Franks strike with vigor and with fury. They slice through fists, ribs, and spines, and through clothing right down to living flesh. On to the green grass, the clear blood flows down. Count Roland calls out to Olivier. Lord Companion, I am sure you will agree. The Archbishop is a very fine knight. There is none better in the face of this earth. He has great skill in striking with lance and spear. The Count replies, so let us go to his aid. With these words the Franks begin afresh. The blows are hard, and the battle grievous. There are heavy losses amongst the Franks. 
if you could have seen Roland and Olivier hacking and hewing with their swords. Count Roland sees the heavy losses of his men. He calls to his companion Olivier. Fair lord, dear companion, in God's name, what is your view of this? You see so many fine knights lying on the ground. We cannot but lament for fair, sweet land of France. How many? Of how many men it now stands bereft. O oh, king, friend, if only you were here. Olivier, brother, how should we now act? In what way shall we send him news? Olivier said, I do not know how to reach him. I should rather die than have us suffer shame. Roland said, I shall sound the Oliphant, and Charles, who is going through the pass, will hear it. I pledge to you the Franks will soon return. Olivier said, That would be most shameful, and all your kinsmen would then be blamed. Such shame would endure as long as they live. When I spoke to you of this, you did nothing. But you will not now act so on my advice. If you sound the horn now, there will be no valor in it. Both your arms are now smeared with blood. The Count replies, I have struck most noble blows. Roland says, Our battle is fierce. I shall sound the horn, and King Charles will hear it. Olivier said that would not be a courageous act. When I spoke of this companion, you did not deign to do it. If the king had been here, we should have come to no harm. Those who are there with him deserve no blame. Olivier said, by this beard of mine, if I ever see my noble sister, Aude, you will not lie in her arms. And Roland and Olivier continue to argue. The archbishop hears their quarrel, urging on his horse with his spurs of pure gold. He rode up to them and began to rebuke them. Lord Roland and Lord Olivier, in God's name I beg you, do not argue. To blow the horn would be to no avail, but nevertheless it is now for the best. Let the king come, then he can avenge our deaths. The men of Spain must never leave here joyful. Our Franks will dismount here. They will find us dead and hacked to pieces, and they will raise us on to pack horses in coffins. They will shed tears of sorrow and pity for us, and bury us in a church's hallowed ground. No wolf or pig or dog will devour us. Roland replies, Lord, you speak well. Roland set the olifant to his lips. He takes a firm grip of it and blows with all his might. The hills are high and the sound travels far. A full thirty leagues they heard it echo. Charles heard it and all his companions. The king said, Our men are doing battle. But Ganelon made this retort. From anyone else, this would have seemed a great untruth. And here we have one of the mysteries of the Roland manuscript, A-O-I, which we will talk about later. Always after a very grave, serious passage. Count Roland, with pain and distress, sounds his olifant in great agony. The clear blood gushes forth from his mouth, and in his skull the temple bursts. The sound of the horn which he holds carries far. Charles hears it, and as he makes his way through the pass, Duke Name heard it, and the Franks listened to it. The king said, I can hear Roland's horn. He would never have blown it if he were not in a fight. Ganelon replies, There is no battle. You are old, hoary, and white-haired. Such words you make to seem like a child. 
You are well aware of Roland's great pride. It is a wonder that God has stood for it for so long. Once he captured Noble without your orders. The Saracens poured out from within it and attacked the good vassal Roland. Later he cleansed the blood from the meadows with water, so that no one would see what he had done. For a mere hair he would blow his horn all day. Now he is just boasting before his peers. There is no army on earth who would have dared attack him. Keep riding, why do you delay? The great land of France is very far ahead. Count Roland is bleeding from the mouth. In his skull the temple is burst. He blows the olifant with pain and anguish. Charles heard it, and so did the Franks. The emperor had his trumpets sounded. The Franks dismount and arm themselves. With hauberks and helmets and gilded swords, they have fine shields and spears, which are large and sturdy, and white, red, and blue pennons. All the barons in the army mount their horses. All the way through the pass, they spur them on with vigor. Each says to his neighbor, If we could see Roland before he dies, we should deal great blows together with him. What matter? For they have delayed too long. The evening sky becomes brighter, and their weapons gleam in the sun. Hauberks and helmets give off flashes of light, and so do their shields, which are richly painted with flowers, and their spears and their gilded pennons. Full of wrath, the emperor rides, and the Franks as well, grieving and sorrowful. There is no one who does not weep profusely, and they are greatly afraid for Roland. The king has Count Ganelon seized, and he handed him over to his household cooks. He summons the master cook, Besguin. Guard him for me well, as befits a criminal. He has betrayed my household. High are the hills, dark and huge. The valleys are deep. The waters flow swiftly. They sound their bugles. Front and rear, the emperor rides with great wrath. And so do the Franks, distressed and sorrowful. No one fails to weep and show his grief. They pray to God that he protect Roland until they arrive upon the battlefield. Together with him they will strike mighty blows. What matter? It is to no avail. They delay too long. They cannot get there in time. Roland looks up at the hills and the mountains. He sees so many Franks lying dead and mourns them like a noble knight. Lord Barons, may God have mercy on you. May he grant all your souls a place in paradise and let them rest among the celestial flowers. I have never seen better vassals than you. You have given me long and faithful service and conquered such great lands for Charles's use. How sad that the Emperor raised you, O oh, land of France, you are a most fair country. Today, in such awful ruin, you stand bereft. Frankish barons, I see you dying for me. No longer can I protect you or give you succor. Olivier, brother, I must not fail you. I shall die of grief if nothing else kills me. Lord Companion, let us get back to the fray. Count Roland returned to the battlefield. He holds Durendal and strikes like a vassal, slicing Faldron of Puy in two, and twenty-four of their most esteemed fighters. Never will any man be so bent on vengeance. 
just as a stag flees before the hounds, so the pagans take flight before Roland. When the pagans saw that the Franks were few in number, they become arrogant and confident. They said to each other, The emperor is wrong. Margany sat astride a sorrel-colored horse. He urges it on with his golden spurs, and from behind strikes Olivier right in the back. He shattered the white hauberk he was wearing, and rammed his lance right through his breast. Then he says, You have received a mighty blow. Charles left you in the pass for your destruction. He did us wrong, and should not be allowed to boast. On you alone, I have taken ample revenge for our men. Olivier feels that his wound is mortal. He grips Alteclair with his burnished steel and strikes Marganis on his pointed helmet of gold, sending its flowers and stones tumbling to the ground. He slices through his head right down to his front teeth. Raising his sword on high, he flung him down dead. Then he shouts for Roland's help. Never will he have his fill of vengeance now. In the thick of the fray, he strikes like a baron, slicing through the land shafts and the bucklers, through feet and fists, saddles and sides. Anyone who has seen him dismembering Saracens, piling up their bodies on the ground, would have remembered what a good vassal he was. Nor does he forget the battle cry of Charles. He shouts, Montjoie, loud and clear, then calls to Roland, his friend and his peer, Lord Companion, come and fight at my side. In great sorrow we shall part this day. Roland looks at Olivier's face. It was colorless, livid, pale and wan. The clear red blood streams forth from his body, and splashes of it fall upon the ground. God, said the Count, I do not know what to do. Lord Companion, your courage has done you no good. No man will ever be your equal. O oh, fair land of France, how bereft you will be today of good vassals, destroyed and ruined. The Emperor will suffer such a grievous loss through this. With these words, he faints upon his horse. And Olivier who has a mortal wound, has lost so much blood that his sight is blurred. Neither near nor far can he see clearly enough to be able to recognize a living soul. His companion, when he encountered him, receives a blow on his helmet studded with golden gems. He cleaves right through it down to the nasal, but the blow did not reach as far as his head. At this blow, Roland looked at him, and asked him in gentle, tender tones, Lord Companion, do you intend to do this? This is Roland, who loves you so dearly. You had not challenged me in any way. Olivier said, Now I can hear your voice, but I cannot see you. May God watch over you. Did I strike you? Pardon me for this. Roland replies, I have not been hurt. I pardon you here and before God. With these words they bowed to each other. See how they part with such great love. Olivier feels the grip of death. Both his eyes roll within his head. His hearing and his vision are now completely gone. He dismounts and lies upon the ground. He confesses his sins, and with both hands joined, raised to heaven. He blessed Charles in the fair land of France, and his companion Roland above all men. His heart fails him, his helmet slips forward, his entire body falls to the ground. The Count is dead. He can delay no longer. Roland the Brave weeps for him and mourns. Never will you hear greater grief 
we have heard the bugles of the men of France. Charles, the mighty king, is on his way back. Count Roland never loved a coward, nor arrogant men, nor those of evil character, nor any knight, unless he were a good vassal. He called to Archbishop Turpin, Lord, you are on foot, and I am on horseback. For love of you, I shall make a stand here. Together we shall endure both good and ill. I shall not abandon you because of any man. Before long, we shall make the pagans pay for this assault. The finest blows are those which come from Durandal. The archbishop said, A curse on him who does not strike well. Charles, who will avenge us, is on his way back. And they fight on just the two of them, against the Saracen army. Roland's shield was broken and pierced, and the mail in his hauberk smashed and torn. The Saracens failed to get through his body, but the Yantif was wounded in three places. He was left for dead beneath the Count's body. The Saracens take flight, leaving him be. Count Roland remains there on foot. Returning towards Spain with all haste, the Saracens flee, and Count Roland has no way of pursuing them. He has lost his war horse, his charger, Veyanti. Like it or no, he remains on foot. He went to help Archbishop Turpin and unlaced his golden helmet from his head, removed his light and shining hauberk, and cut his tunic into strips. He placed the pieces in his great wounds, and then drew him to his breast in close embrace. Afterwards, he laid him down gently on the green grass. He beseeched him with great tenderness. O oh, noble man, pray give me leave to go, our companions whom we loved so dearly, are now all dead. We must not leave them there. I intend to go and look for them and pick them out and place them here before you, side by side. The archbishop said, Leave them and return. This is your field and mine. Thanks be to God. Roland sets off across the field alone, searching the valleys and the mountains where he found many of his brave Franks dead. The archbishop cannot hold back his tears. He raises his hand and gives his blessing, and says to Roland, What a fate has befallen you, lords. May God, the glorious one, receive all your souls. May he place them amongst the celestial flowers. Never again. Shall I see the mighty emperor? Roland found his companion Olivier, and, clasping him tightly to his breast, comes as best he can to the archbishop, laid him on a shield with the others. Roland says, Fair companion Olivier, you were the son of Duke Renier, who held the march of the Vale of René. When Count Roland sees his peers dead, and Olivier, whom he loved so dearly, he was filled with emotion and begins to weep. Roland feels that his death is near. Through his ears his brains are seeping. He took the elephant and seized Durendal in his other hand. Further than a crossbow can fire an arrow, he goes over towards Spain into a fallow field. He climbs onto a mound beneath a beautiful tree. Four great marble blocks are there, and on the green grass he fell upon his back. There he fainted, for death is close to him. and the trees tower up their four great block 
blocks of shining marble. Count Roland faints on the green grass. A Saracen watches him all the while, feigning death and lying amongst the others. He has smeared his body and his face with blood. He gets to his feet and rushes forward. He was handsome and strong and very brave. In his arrogance, he embarks on an act of mortal folly. He seized Roland's body and his armor and spoke thus. Charles's nephew is vanquished. I shall take this sword to Arabia. As he drew it out, the Count began to come round. He sensed that he was taking away his sword. He opened his eyes and spoke these words to him. You are not one of our men, it seems to me. He grasps the olifant, which he never wanted to lose, and strikes him on the golden helmet studded with golden gems. He shatters the steel, his skull and his bones. He put both eyes out of their sockets and cast him down dead at his feet. Then he says, Wretched pagan, how did you dare grab hold of me without thought for right or wrong? Anyone who hears of this will regard you as mad. Now my olifant is split at its broad end. The crystal and the gold have come away. And thus Roland passes beneath the pine tree. And that is how Charlemagne finds him when he arrives with his army at the pass of Roncesvalles, dead and with Olifant split. Let's have a look at the French, looking at the old French and modern French edition. Folio classique of la chanson de Roland. You will see that each lace or stanza is marked here. And the modern French in Arabic numbers with the old French in Roman. Like all of the chansons de geste or the songs of deeds written in Old French and Anglo-Norman. These lace or stanzas are written in decasyllabic assonance. That means each line has ten syllables and ends on an assonant sound. For example, Roland le Baron Tenez le brun, reprevrin, canelin, pastin, un brun. Pain, chevalier, pied, grassier, crucier, auberger, repéré. These songs or chansons de geste were performed by traveling minstrels called jongleurs and often the verses will repeat some things either for poetic emphasis or because people might not have been paying attention or because a certain passage was important or enjoyed by the audience. So there's a lot of repetition, a lot of foreshadowing, but also the chansons de geste were not fantastical pieces of literature. They were mostly about war, which is why a lot of the descriptions, though linguistically beautiful and poetic are quite graphic in their descriptions. They're about heroism and illustrious family lines, mainly having to do with 
Charlemagne and his parents and his extended family. Charlemagne, of course, was king of the Franks, a loyal ally to the Pope in Rome, and a great conqueror. He expanded the boundaries of his empire in Western Europe, outward from his central territory in modern-day France and Germany. In 800, he was crowned emperor and is seen as the great ruler and founder of the Holy Roman Empire, which lasted until 1918. if only in name. I'm going to read some of the old French for you, and then we'll write some of it out and look at some of the linguistic properties. We're going to look at lace number 140. Roland regardait immense et slaris de sel de France y veille dans mors Jésus et il les pleurait comme chevalier gentil Seigneur parent de vos aideux merci de vos ennemis autrui il parie enceinte fleur il est passé, Jésus, meilleur vassal de vos hanquins navis. Si l'ingement tout en m'avait servi, à Oe Carlon, si grand pays conquis, les empereurs tant de mar vos nourris, terre de France, moleste douce pays. Oh, déserte, attendre poste exil, parent français, promets vos veilles mûrir. Je ne vous bois dans ces ne garantis, et vos déus qui hank ne mentit. Olivier, frère, vos ne déis, je vaillir de toi. Saltrune, mi aussi. Sire, campain, Alain, y référie. Let's have a look at that one. 
Pisces. So this will be Il or Li for he. Cell, of course, is those, the demonstrative pronoun. And Tang, Mo. Um, we have Mo, again, Mors, Mortis in Latin, and Mo with the silent T en français. in 
interesting formations here for the Anglo-Norman Old French. And those lines in the modern French, which they haven't used the cognate words, but I'll read anyway. Rolin parcours du regard les monts et les collines. Il voit l'innombrable français mort, étendu à terre, et il est pleure un noble chevalier. Seigneur chevalier, que Dieu vous prenne en pitié, qu'il ouvre son paradis à l'âme de chacun de vous. our battle of Ronsvar Pass. A pass in the Pyrenees Mountains where Roland died with his sword Durinda and his friend Olivier by his side. I think we were using the red one for Olivier. And of course to save his king and emperor, Charlemagne. I hope you've enjoyed this soft reading session. Please like if you enjoyed it, and leave a comment. Stay relaxed. Stay chill. Be good to yourself. Be kind to others.